alaikum. Good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, in this talk, I will be sharing with you a look at some of the lesser known qasidas um, or odes by three of the more recent masters of the Shaviliya Tariqa as holographic windows through which to glimpse the landscape of the spiritual journey undergone by those established in the Sufi tradition of Islam. From the 13th century, the Shadili line of Gnostic masters has flourished and spread throughout North Africa to as far afield as Indonesia and became one of the most powerful chains of transmission in the Western Islamic world, um, but also within the Orient of universal existence, the realm of the supranational. When we, look, we talk about the Orient, the East, it is, the, it is higher consciousness, matters to do with gnosis, the ontology of being, and when we look at the West, it's, we consider this the rational, existential knowledge. So their contribution is part of humanity's heritage of higher spiritual knowledge. So I'm going to look a little bit about the silsila, the key figures um, behind it, and how I encountered these odes myself. And then we're going to look at some of the key themes of these poetical works, the love of God, the yearning for unveiling the mysteries of reality and the self-effacing way in which to approach this journey and the ecstatic states that come upon the adept as a consequence not only of his own questing effort but also by the bestowal of God's grace. So I titled this talk Holograms <clears throat> because it's a, it's a 3D image, any part of which, if broken up, reflects the whole. It's made with several components, and one of them is a laser. So if we use the laser of higher consciousness to bring into focus this path, we can condition ourselves to become activated by grace in order to claim the fulfillment of the covenant between God and man, the mithaq of alastu birabikum, am I not your Lord? And we're going to choose five odes, and uh, hopefully to highlight the fundamental touchstones of the soul's journey. Not knowing what kind of an audience I was going to be speaking to, I have prepared a few comments about Tasawwuf. Human existence is often depicted as a journey through time and space. Our biological chronology makes a powerful argument for a linear progression through time, while the yearning of the heart to find enduring peace and contentment makes us explore other dimensions, such as metaphorical space, head space, sacred space, and indeed a space beyond our limited selves. We only start to talk about being on a path, however, once we recognize our dire need for direction along this trajectory from not knowing to knowing, from our existential imprisonment in the body to the metaphysical freedom of awakened consciousness. The inner spiritual tradition of Islam charts this journey in myriads of ways and, of course, finds its bedrock in the Qur'an, the revelation of the Qur'an, and in the life pattern, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. So this inner spiritual tradition known as Sufism came to be named as a tradition within the Islamic body politic in counterpoint, really, to the excessive worldly concerns that the Muslim community soon fell prey to with their rapid success in establishing uh, an empire and also the later ebbs and flows of Muslim civilization. Though some of the doctrines that arose from among the Sufis attracted controversy from Muslim theologians, um, just as some of the philosophers did, um, and also some of their practices were regarded with circumspection sometimes even by Sufis themselves, for example, Samaa, audition. Um, there, is, there are quite a few Sufis who consider that to be potentially dangerous in the hands of beginners and you know, too much of a powerful effect. But on the whole, the consensus is that some form of Samaa, some form of audition is helpful. But we must not make the mistake to think that Sufism was ever considered as a separate entity to the practice of Islam. In fact, it's the spiritual domain of Islam that Tasawwuf concerns itself with, not the legal or the social. These are givens. And it deals with the interior aspects of faith at increasingly intense levels of concentration. So the matters concerning Sufis were asceticism, zuhud, the nature of piety, the majesty of God, 
fear of God, how to love God, the yearning for God, unveiling, coming to know reality, the states and the stages along the way, the nature of the self, the nafs, the ego self, the, the, the center from which we experience life, and its relationship to the higher element within us, the soul or the spirit, and the nuances between effort and striving and grace and bestowal. It's, in short, it's the nature of practical lived metaphysics. Now, the concerns of a tariqa, the, the, the different brotherhoods that developed and branched out, were built upon these elements. But they didn't seek to perpetuate themselves. Their, the purpose of the tariqa was to move from sharia towards hakika, to realize the inner truth, the reality, and as such as part of a living cumulative tradition. Um, really, the Shadhiliya started to flourish in the, eight, in the 12th century, 12th, 13th century, and uh, I would, would like to share a quote with you from uh, an 18th century um, uh, Shadhili Sheikh called Sidi Ali al german who said that Sufism is observing the outer law of the way of Muhammad, surrendering the will to the Lord of the worlds, and having good character towards the Muslims. This is a very simple, elegant, pristine summary of the, the, the overall flavor that characterizes the Shadhiliya, because the Shadhiliya really uh, uh, is, the, is the outwardly sober form of Sufism. Although, like all Sufi tariqas, it is, gives appropriate space to transcendent states of consciousness, which we identify as ecstasy, but the, and while we will be seeing some of evidence of that in the poems, they're not talked about in any self-seeking way. The, the person whose name is lent to this branch of Tasawwuf is um, Sheikh Abul Hassan al-Shadili, who is known as the Ocean Without Shore. This is his tomb. Sadly, we don't have photographs from the 12th, 13th century. Um, he was born in Morocco, and he's buried in Egypt. And uh, he was a hugely successful sheikh under, after having spent many years with a great being called Muley Abdul Salam ibn Mashish up in Tatwan um, in the um, Atlas Mountains. And when he um, met uh, uh, Muley Abdul Salam, he was so ready for his uh, induction as his student that uh, as he was doing wudu, he realized, he says, Oh Allah, I have been washed of my knowledge and action so that I do not possess knowledge or action except what comes to me from this sheikh. After many years of being with him and after his sheikh passed away, he moved to Tunis and there under the patronage of the Hafsid uh, leader, Abu Zakriya, he attracted a huge following and from among the nobles to the common people. And then again from there he ended up in Alexandria where he was given a tower in the city walls, huge massive building, they had vicar halls and everything, and again there attracting the sultan's families and notable scholars, jurists and traditionists numbered amongst his followers. And uh, later on in life, when he was asked who his spiritual master was, he used to reply, I used to be the close follower of Muli Abdul Salam ibn Mashish, but I am no, longer, no more the close follower of any human master. And this is the highest level of which no, your mastery transfers from a human being to, to God himself. Your own need is utterly, your own need of a master is utterly dissolved. There are other names that are associated with uh, the Shadhiliya. His successor was um, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi. Um, and after him, the next significant figure that we might like to mention is Ibn Atta'ullah, whose famous hikam or uh, wisdom of Ibn Atala, you may have come across, and also a, a, collect a book on the uh, uh, commentary, uh, com um, book of wisdom, <clears throat> and a commentary on vicar, on how to do the invocation or remembrance of God in their tradition. Um, mention should also be made of the fact that after him we have. Um, Sheikh Muley uh, Abdul uh, Al Arabi Al Darqawi, who was born around in the middle of the 18th century, and some of the odes that we're going to look at follow this branch 
of the Shadiliya. One of the other um, branches uh, that we're also going to look at is the Alawiya, which is based in Algeria. And um, as you know, that because the Shadili spread throughout, in, as I said, throughout North Africa. Now, some of the teachings, the core fundamental teachings of what the Shadili concentrated on was Tawheed. And the core methodology was Dhikr. For them, the Aqidah and Sharia was absolutely critical. And they didn't want to complicate their Tawheed with notions of Wahdat al-Wujud, which developed subsequent to Ibn Arabi's. Uh, Ibn Arabi never never uh, uh, promoted a doctrine called Wahdat al-Wujud. It was his subsequent students who developed that particular phraseology. But their, their, their Tawheed was a very simplified, pure one. And it was always conjoined to the remembrance of God, which is a form of vocalized vicar, which is, travels to the, um, uh, uh, which also then becomes internally. Generally, though, they stress devotion, zuhud. The Shalidis were to follow a normal life and not remove themselves from their communities or their vocations or trade. It was looked down upon if you did not have a means of livelihood. Nor did they distinguish themselves by any special dress, any khirqa or muraqa'a, any of the robes, nor was it uh, accepted to be a, the, lead the life of a qalandar, a wandering mendicant, such as you might have found in the Indian subcontinent. And in fact, Shadili, uh, Abul Hassan Shadi was quite well dressed in his own times. Also, their zawiyas were not so obvious, their, their centers, their lodges. They often met in homes, and this makes it difficult to trace their history as well. So the emphasis was very much on outer sobriety and inner and, and <coughs> developing the inner life. And of course, being North African, they were all Maliki as well. And that has its own flavor of austerity. <clears throat> How I came across these odes myself, in the late 70s in London, I was in the company of some English Muslims committed to the Sufi path when I first heard these lyrical odes being sung. This was really on account of my parents' interest and connection with them, not my own choice at all. Um, so the foreignness of these songs, sung in, Ang sung in Arabic in circles of men and women seated separately, did not draw me in initially. Um, furthermore, these diwans, these songs, these odes, were sung as a prelude to the heart of the dhikr ceremony, the hadra, where the sounds became stranger and scarier to this teenager, more used to capital radio, top of the pops, or choral singing at school. So another thing, in punk rock Britain, religion was passé, and even as a born Muslim, I was far from socialized or culturalized as one. And really, I had grown up believing Islam was for poor people and the uneducated. No one had ever said this to me, but uh, we'd been subtly conditioned in, uh, into these unspoken assumptions. However, because my parents were becoming increasingly spiritual, uh, I, had become, I was lucky enough to be exposed to the spiritual world before teenage self-consciousness and the tribalism of adolescence claimed me and stopped me from being able to recognize the, the, the voice of truth. Also, the scary strangeness of the circles of Victor uh, that occasionally manifested in our London apartment soon intrigued me. And being lucky enough to know some Arabic and more importantly, being a keen singer myself, I started to read the songs and sing them, and then I fell in love with them. Um, the melodies in which they are sung also helped to penetrate the heart, and they persuaded me that really this was the, this was the matter that life was all about, and this was the fruit. These songs spoke to me of the fruit of the practice of Islam, and this was what I was interested in. So, of the lesser-known shiuch of the um, contemporary era, one of them is quite well known, Sheikh Ahmed al Alawi. Um, Martin Lings has done a very good book, a Sufi saint of the 20th century. Um, we're going to look at one of his qasidas, not well known um, in the West. And then after him, we're going to look at a qasida by his successor, Sheikh Faituri, which is not at all known uh, or printed or studied. Um, so you'll have to make do with my translation. And after that, we will look at 
um, four qasidas from Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib from the Darqawiyya branch. These are two branches of the main trunk of the Shadiliyya. Let A few words about poetry, Sufi poetry. All poetry is the linguistic expression of a higher cosmological order. And it, all of them have principles of harmony and rhythm. And Arabic is beautifully suited to this. Sufi poetry, we might think of, because I'm sure everybody has been exposed to Rumi or Hafiz or Sanai. Or, so we, we often, what, often what we come across, especially in translation, is the ecstatic poetry. Uh, expressing all the different hals and maqams that, and unveilings, the tajalli and the kash that happens on this path. So whilst it's also ecstatic, Sufi poetry is also very didactic and instructive. So the qasidas we're looking at today com present complete packages of the key teachings of the path, but from different angles. Um, for example, the, not that I'm going to talk about this one today, but if there's one that is about uh, penitence, that is one way in to the state of humility in which God may look upon you favorably. And if the voice is that of praise, you enter through that one and you can bask in the glory of the divine. All of these songs were meant to be sung, um, <clears throat> odes meant to be sung. And this relates to the strong tradition in Islam of the beautiful word. Um, ours has, the Islamic culture has been underpinned by oral transmission, person to person, <coughs> voice to voice. We're fortunate to be able to have it recorded now, and people write books, but the primary mode was transmission. There was an energy, there was a vibrational energy that came along with that sharing. Now these poems also share the same features a lot of other poetry. They come in couplets, they rhyme, they have rhythm, and these are enhanced by the melodies in which they're sung, and I'm going to share some of these melodies with you, hopefully. Um, it's a common feature of Sufi poetry to have a refrain, a radif, which punctuates and gives a sense of cyclicality as well as progression. And this repetitiveness, repetitiveness really echoes the divine attribute of abidingness, of al-baqi, continuity. And the context in which these are sung is very important as well. Um, they are done congregationally, and this is because done collectively, it amplifies the effect of these songs. <clears throat> and also, the tradition of the Shadaliya is not like the Mevlaviya or other Eastern um, traditions where you have more Sama. This is not performance, this is participation. You're supposed to participate in it, not just listen to it. So, let's look at the... Can you read it? Does it is it clear? I'm looking at it and it looks fuzzy, but I'm wearing reading glasses here. Sheikh al Alawi's uh, poem here is called Advance. I'll play you a little clip. So, that's just to give you a taste. And why not use a woman's voice for a change as well? Um, advance are you in difficulty if you desire the remedy? Oh, excuse me. I'm technically challenged here. Uh, advance are you in difficulty if you desire the remedy? And ask and desire what you love from us. The key, the, the idea of remedy is a medicine. The sheikh is the doctor and the murid is the patient. We can think of the sheikh as a doctor of the soul, really. Um, then he goes on to say, how do I get rid of this little, oh, there it is. Oh. Can somebody help me? How do I get rid of the, 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 the window here? This is obscuring my being able to read that. How do you get okay. rid of that? That's it, but it's going to start again. Okay, we go back then. 
That's fine. Thank you. What you see of us is true and other. Our meaning is a meaning which encircles all. So what you see of us, the Sheikh is talking to the Murid, what you see of us, what we represent and symbolize to you, the awakened, enlightened being, is true. And also, not true, and other. But our meaning is a meaning which encircles all. We are not just form. We are also meaning. We strove so we were above the standard. By weakness we obtained all the powers. Well, this is a very key teaching in the Shadili uh, Odes that comes across beautifully here. Striving, making the effort, and yet, by weakness we obtained all the powers. Not really by your own effort. You have to do it. You have to do the muhasaba, the, the vigil, the calling yourself into account. You have to become aware of yourself, your actions, your motivations, aware of which you is now talking, which aspect of the nafs, of the ego self is dominating. Is it nafs al-amara? Is it nafs al-lawama? Is it the commanding self? Is it the bl blaming self? And these are all Quranic uh, uh, concepts that come from the Quran. But by weakness, meaning by submission, فَبِالْضُعْف, the word, Arabic word uses بَالْضُعْفِنِلْنَا By weakness, by humility, not by power and strength. And then the Shaykh continues on and says, We wandered from the cosmos and all other, the otherness. Allah forbid, we are not among the people of allegation. So even while the Shaykh is talking in the voice of, from a high, high maqam, he's still not making a claim. <coughs> Take the real from us and leave passion, worldly passion, not ishq, not the himma and the yearning for knowing reality, but leave aside hawa, false illusory passions. Take the real from us. Be as we were, wa kun kama kunna wa mutwan tawa, and die and vanish. Now this is not a reference to suicide. This is the reference to what the Prophet said, um, die before you die. And in another hadith, uh, people are asleep. When they die, they wake up. So we are in some kind of somnambulistic stupor here. And until we awaken up into reality, we are in a sense dead, not yet fully alive to this inner reality. And here again, just to share a little bit of poetic um, the poetic uh, uh, device when he says, وَكُنْ كَمَا كُنَّا وَمُطْوَنْ طَوَى Vanish, fold up. Withdraw from us, by us, to the valley of Tuwa. In Arabic, you know, it's كُنْ كَمَا كُنَّا وَمُطْوَنْ طَوَى وَغِبْ بِنَا عَنَّا بِوَادِي طُوَى The wadi, of course, where Moses takes off his sandals and it's the sacred valley and where Allah speaks to him. So, our root is good and the branch is level. We are established in the deen, we are established in sharia, we are established. And therefore, what comes from us is a level tree. Our arrival is a garden, waslun jannah, tabal in najwa, pleasant for intimate conversation. Prepare for beauty and drink in order to be quenched. Of course, so much Sufi poetry uses the imagery of drink and intoxication and wine. There is no reference to wine and it, clearly it's metaphorical. Uh, a drink that is being talked about here, washrab kaytarwa, and it's also used in Sufi terminology in terms of tastes and having small exposures, small oncomings to you, like a shirb, it's like a sip of something, and drink in order to be quenched because we're all thirsty, our human condition is that of thirst. Wa illa fatrukna fi hayzin nawa, and if you do not do this, he says to the murid, then leave us in the distance. If you do not make us the medicine for ardent passion, why waste your time with me? Um, every man has what he intends. Every man among us has what he intends. So, the next... Um, I have no sound clip to entertain you with, um, but it is from Sheikh Faituri, who my own Sheikh met him before he died, I, I think in 1979. And... Uh, <laughs> He was the, uh, an inheritor from Sheikh Alawi who died in 1934 and uh, in Libya. Um, 
his poem it's a very bad copy which I've had to translate myself and half the letters at the beginning are missing so for those of you who enjoy Arabic you have to supply an alif at the beginning اترك يا مريد نفسك ما تريد إن رمت المزيد من أسرار الله ادخل الطريق والزم الرفيق يسقق العتيق من خمرة الله there's two mistakes in the Arabic there um, in the spelling Abandon, O oh, Murid, what yourself seeks if you desire more from Allah of his secrets. Enter on the path and hold fast to the friend. So these are the conditions of approach. He will pour for you the ancient wine from Allah. I have understood by him, from him, to him. Allah is the source of tajalli. Allah educates you, brings you and speaks to you. We have the hadith that the, whole, uh, the heavens and earth do not contain me, but the heart of the mu'min contains me. So, therefore, you can, it is a, it's a sort of a self-perpetuating process, providing you engage in purification of the self, tahdi and grooming of the self, tahdi bun nafs. Whoever knows him has gathered the secret of Allah, the way of the path, the sovereign king of realization, the best of friends to the murid of Allah, al-alawi, master of buzidi. So he's now pre- He's he's praising his and uh, uh, his antecedents in the spiritual line. He says he unshackled my fetters, and I became free for Allah. He enabled me to know myself and enter into intimacy. Unsi. He says arrafni nafsi wa adkhulni na unsi. Insan comes from the root word uns to be familiar, to be sociable, to be intimate, and our condition is to be like that. In a sacred presence, I disappeared from all other than him. Feyturi, and he talks now here about himself in the third person, which is a common feature of Sufi poetry. Feyturi, weak, feeble. I came in surrender to the great succour of this knowledge of Allah, Sheikh Al-Alawi. Pray peace upon the master, light of guidance. He brought my heart to life, and I witness the master. It's the same word used. Salli ya Mawla, Nur al-Huda, ahya li qalbi shahadtul Mawla. So he's acknowledging his worldly master, connecting him to the ultimate master. The next few qasidas I'd like to share with you are from Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib. Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib was uh, also from Morocco, born in uh, um, Fez in 1876. And he had a traditional background and uh, upbringing, uh, studied at Quran in the Kutab and then uh, went to Qarawiyin. And in those, in the traditional sense, you study with a, a professor and you, you study books with them, um, rather as you might do in a master's or a PhD uh, sense nowadays. And he is a Sharif, he's a Husseini Sharif, Sayyid, and uh, died in 1972. And on his way to Hajj, buried in Meknes. And uh, I have an anecdote. There's not much avail- information available on him, um, but I have, an, I have it from an anecdotal source that he participated in the resistance against the French, which interestingly, um, um, Imam Shadili also, even though he was blind in 1244, um, he actually participated in... In 12, 1248, he participated in the Battle of Mansoura against the, uh, the crusade led by St. Louis, St. Louis <coughs> from France. So there has always been um, a, a tradition, particularly in North African Sufism, of being aroused to political action when, need, when called for. Right. We're going to look at the uh, um, a poem which is to do with the, the praise of the Prophet. It's known as the song written before the Prophet. And I have a nice sound clip for you to hear. Yes.
to do this to get out of it and back into it. Okay. That's just to give you a sense of how it sounds congregationally. The prophet and praise of the prophet is usually tucked into every single ode at the end in the last couplet. But this is a whole poem about praising the prophet. Because everything that the Sufi does, everything that the aspirant seeks, connects back to the haqiqa Muhammadiya, the Muhammadi reality, for which we have been told the entire creation was created. We are present in the garden of the Prophet, seeking acceptance and welcome. We have come, O best of refuges, bowed in humility and bewilderment. So the approach is humble, humility and bewilderment. Ask Allah to give us every help, beseeching the Prophet for intercession, so that we may attain our desire at the time debts fall due, waqt al-hululi, the time of death, the time of resurrection. You have a vast power which is beyond compare and a message greater than every messenger, acknowledging and referring again to the Prophet being Khatam al-Anbiya. You are the door to Allah in every good thing. Whoever comes to you gains acceptance and union. Every secret which came to the prophets is from your sublimity, confirmed through transmission. The nuqul, the, the idea of, again, this is a very important theme of Sufi life, that there has to be a transmission between living, uh, between, uh, living teachers. There is, of course, another tradition which is counter uh, uh, that, which is the Awasi tradition, which is self-effulgant connection and um, awakenings and, un and enlightenment. But the generality has, uh, the general uh, body of Sufi Tariqas rely on absolute presence in transmission. I have looked to the Prophet to plead with Allah in my affairs, for he is the accepted intercessor. All whose journey ends at the house of a generous host get what they ask for, even their most extreme desires. We have given thanks to Allah for every time that he has given us the gift of a visit to the messenger and a visit to all those in Baqi'ah. So now we are acknowledging all the people who are with the Prophet. Anybody who is in the Prophet's presence was touched by him and, was, and received his barakah. So by us thinking of them and turning our focus and attention and acknowledging them, we hope to also gain something of that ourselves. And a visit to every wife and daughter and son of the deliverer of mankind on the day debts fall due. And a visit to every martyr in Uhud and the uncle of the messenger. We have asked by them perfect peace for us on our journey to our land and when we enter it. Our land. We are claiming another land beyond the mountain Qaf of Rumi's poetry um, and uh, Attar's Conference of the Birds. That is where we belong. We do not belong here. We are in this world, but not of it. We have sought deliverance on the day of gathering and safety from the ignorant. Our Lord, bless the Prophet and his family and companions and the followers. Everybody is included here. The next is a short qasida, a more ecstatic one which is the remembrance of my Lord. I'll play a little sound clip. <laughs> I prefer my clip. <laughs> I'm going to have to go forward to get out of this and come back to it. There we are. I'm ecstatic alone in the vicar of my Lord. The vicar of my Lord, it is the cure. Shifa, it says, Shifa. I have loved a Lord on whom I count in, on in each single thing. 
هو اعتمادي ما اعتماد and it is he who decrees وكل حب لغير ربي فيه العذاب وفيه الشقاء and in each love for what is other than he in it is pain in it is grief this is an absolute description of the reality of our of our uh, existence as soon as you if you love anyone or anything or any idea you will be disappointed because they will never remain everything is ephemeral except god then he talks about something that we hear about the sufis talk about fana annihilation of the self annihilation an extinction an obliteration where you lose the sense of yourself and you become aware of a much higher consciousness but he's talking now about a stage even beyond that oh the victory of the one annihilated beyond annihilation ya fawza fanin an al fanai he will have life and going on fana isn't a one off proposition it's a continuous unveiling and there are levels and deeper degrees to it and once you have that you are really then brought back to life through that death of self you are brought back to life again lahul baqa'u you have ongoingness and the short qasida ends oh lord bless muhammad from his essence light comes and radiance too and his family and noble companions they make the trusts and they keep them too they're always included and never forgotten this is more in keeping with the kind of poetry that we are uh, the westerners are familiar with it's called the manifestation of essence and it's um an allegorical uh, 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 an allegorical poem talking about the the beloved as leila personified in the feminine which is going to listen to a clip اشتمس بدا من عالم الغيب ضوءها امن كشفت على ذات ليل سطورها الله الله Alhamdulillah, I'm going to have to go backwards to get out of this. Oh. And back. So, has the light of the sun appeared from the world of the unseen? Or have the veils of Layla been lifted from her essence? How can you express what is inexpressible? You have to come down to the level of, the, of human analogies in order to be able to relate. Yes, the longing for Layla, for her beloved friend, has grown until she has revealed her love, so that he has become a captive of her ardent desire. Layla desires him. Layla is calling and yearning for the beloved is is calling for the the lover, because we uh, the Hadith Qudsi says, "Kuntu kanzun maghfiyun." I was a hidden treasure. I loved to be known. Therefore, I created so that I could be known. and that is the pull there is an implicit inherent attraction in our beingness so the ishq is triggered here she did not leave until she had given him a drink from her goblet the wine mithal again there is no blame because we're not talking about uh, illicit drink here drink for the wine is her speech and she is not but the presence of truth who manifests herself through forms who every light uh, every light vanishes she has manifested the unique beauty of the form of design in the depth of her being look at the attributes of the beloved manifested in you by allah none have attained a complete bliss except the one who becomes a humble slave and seeks her out again The only way you can approach this is to is is to absolutely be in dhilla 
and thus she immersed the ugliness of his nature in the beauty of hers, and light shone from him, their rays appearing. We can never escape from the shadows of the self, we can never escape from the nafs and its ugliness and its m scheming machinations. But what you can do is turn away from it. You can turn away from shadow to light, and you can therefore sublimate the the uh, the the impurities. And it carries on so that he withdrew from the sensory, which was a barrier, and embraced a meaning from which it is unlawful to separate. Once you turn to this, once you start, you cannot get off this path. <laughs> it will claim you. Therefore, let your goal be to commit yourself, O oh my brother, and avoid otherness, and her gentle breeze will waft over the beloved ones from you. You will open the hearing of the wayfarer's heart, because the subtle knowledge of her is her proof. Grant us union with her always, and cause us to withdraw from every sensory existence. So towards the end of this beautiful ecstatic exposition, back to being the teaching sheikh, the didactic bit, and then... The dua. You will open the hearing. We talked about hearing. It's so important to learn to listen, to learn to recognize the signs. The signs which the Quran says are on the horizon and within themselves. This is another picture of Sheikh Muhammad Nabi because we're up to the last qasida that I would like to share with you. And it's known as annihilation in Allah. Now, all these odes have a place also in the dhikr gatherings. And this is one of the odes that would be sung towards the end of that section, before you go into Hadra. Having spent time listening to these words of admonition and reminding you of the ecstasy that is there available for you, then you are, your thought process has been narrowed down, you're, you, are, you are focused, you are entering a zone of single-pointedness where you can then disappear into the Hadra, which is really literally means presence, the Hadra Rabbaniya. So let's listen to this clip. Again, uh, it's not a congregational one. I couldn't find it. <laughs> of time so um, so this the sheikh is speaking to the murid O seeker of annihilation in Allah say all the time Allah Allah simple prescription and withdraw into him from other than him and with your heart see Allah so shuhud or witnessing is not visual it's not extra it's not sensory it's extra interior sensory and withdraw from him into him from other than him. Oh, sorry, I read that already. And with your heart, see Allah. Gather your concerns in him, and he will be enough in place of other than Allah. This is a reference to Allah will be kifaya. Allah will be enough for you. Tukfa bi an ghayrullah. It's about tawakkul. Be a pure slave to him, and you will be free from other than Allah. Kun abdan sirfan lahu. Be a slave only to him. Takun hurran an ghayrullah. So reflect and perfect. Your Ubudiya. Submit yourself to him and be humble, and you will win a secret from Allah. Again, the notion that be, be, be low, work against the ego self, challenge it, see it for its dubious qualities, at the same time as knowing that it is the vehicle through which you can exist. Invoke him with gravity and sincerity in the presence of the slaves of Allah. Seriousness, attention, company, the brotherhood, hence tariqas. Conceal it when he is manifested to you with the lights of the essence of Allah. Waktum idha tajalla lak. If you have tajalli, bi anwarin midatillah, you're supposed to do iktimam. Hide it, not expose it. This is a very shadily trait as well. 
You don't go wearing your enlightenment on a sleeve. With us, other is impossible. We cannot do anything else other than this. For existence belongs to Allah. There is no choice in the matter for the awakened being of being in this mode. Constantly cut through your illusion with a pure tawheed to Allah. We have all got waham. We all have illusion without which we cannot exist because the faculty of waham is what allows us to ascribe value to things. So we have it. Therefore, continuously cut through it. Continuously challenge yourself with a pure tawheed. Oh, I think there was a clip. <laughs> And different tune. Oops. Nearly there. Um, each of these odes, uh, especially the longer ones, can be sung in different tunes. Again, in the hands of skilled people, they can uh, um, they can affect and bring about a greater um, impact upon the participants by the choice of different tunes. So we continue on. Now he's talking about doctrinal issues. So the oneness of action, فَوَحْدَةُ fi'li tabdu, begins at the appear, uh, appears at the beginning of the dhikr of Allah. So this is Tawheed al-Af'al, the oneness of God's acts. And the oneness of attributes come from the love of Allah. When you see all the multifarious uh, uh, sifat of God as one, that comes because of your love of Allah. Min al hubbi fillah. And the oneness of His essence gives going on with Allah. He doesn't describe anything other than the baqa, the abidingness that comes uh, to you. To warrithul baqa billah. So, having done all these things, joy to the one who walks on the path of the dhikr of Allah. Believing in a living sheikh who is agnostic of Allah. Again, based on the principle that if you don't have a, someone to guide you, shaitan is your guide. But what kind of a sheikh are you following? He holds constantly to his love and sells his self to Allah. He rises in the night to recite his word, longing for Allah. And so he gets what he seeks of the power of knowledge in Allah. And then to wrap up, our gifts are from a prophet who is the master of the creatures of Allah. May the purest of blessings be upon him in quantity as great as the knowledge of Allah. And the last one. And his family and companions and everyone who calls to Allah. So this is a full package of what the path is all about. And one of the key Quranic phrases that is re- re- recited in the Shadili tradition a lot is Hasbin Allah wa Ni'mal Wakil. And this is a calligraphy that represents it. <coughs> so I would just like to conclude my presentation today to you all that these Qasidas follow in a long line of transmission in a living cumulative tradition. And the purpose of singing these odes, it brings all the thoughts into position of surrender, repentance, trust, and abandonment of self-concern. And it charts, these poems chart the longings, the yearning, and the tastes and the sips of oncomings and visions, (coughs) awakenings and openings. They're not only expressions of awakenings themselves, of the the shiuch who wrote them, but they're intended to draw you closer to your own awakening. And listening to them, singing them, internalizes their message. They draw you in, they wear off your resistance, they knead you like dough so that your soul can rise. I'd like to just end with a small sound clip of dhikr, of hadra, so once you have spent your time pondering all these ideas, you can have a bit of a, shad- a taste of a Shadali Hadra. That isn't a picture of Shadali Shayukh, but I couldn't find one on the internet. And, and it's obviously in a very grand hall, so it's probably a Sufi, uh, a, a Turkish or e- a Eastern uh, Hanaka. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
حي الله Thank you.